Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this British Library event. Um, my name is Stephen Dryden. I am a, a sound librarian at the British Library, and it's a real uh, thrill to welcome you to this event around the story of Section 28, a notorious law passed in 1988, and is based on a new book, um, which has been written by um, our guest this evening, Paul Baker. Um, this is the first in a programme of events at the library to mark LGBTQ plus history month. So please do check out the rest of the programme. And uh, we're in, delighted tonight to be joined by all of you and um, specifically our partners in national and public libraries, one of which is um, Norwich Millennium Library. So welcome to you this evening. Um, before I introduce the speaker to you, Paul Baker, there's a few housekeeping points that I just want to make for you. Um, we are taking questions and we're going to have a QA and a later on. Um, can I ask that you submit these questions for the panellists using the question box, which is below the video. Um, use the tabs above the video um, to provide feedback to the library. Um, and also, if you are able to donate something to the library's cultural programming. Um, you can also buy copies of Paul's book from our bookshop partner, Gaze the Word, which is based just down the road from us in St Pancras in London, um, the UK's oldest LGBTQ plus bookshop. And that's in a tab above the video, so above us right now. Um, the event is also speech to text, uh, has speech to text captioning. Um, this can be accessed in the tab below the video for anybody who would like to use it and is also being supported live by a BSL interpreter. Thank you, Paul and Debbie for being with us this evening. Um, so our, our speaker tonight, so Paul's going to do a, a presentation for us and then we'll, we'll go into a Q&A. Uh, Paul Baker is Professor of English Language at Lancaster University. His research interests include language and identities and critical discourse analysis. Um, and he's written a fabulous book called Polari. Uh, and if you haven't checked it out, I, uh, so I'll give you the full title. Polari, Fantabulosa, The Story of Polari, Britain's Secret Gay Language, um, which is an amazing book I, I thoroughly recommend um, reading. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to pass to Paul. Thank you very much, Stephen. And thank you very much, um, all of you, for coming um, to this talk. Um, this is a, a book which um, had a lot of personal resonance for me um, to write. And I think it could have ended up being quite an angry book. Um, but there is a lot of humour um, around at the time um, when I was writing um, the book, and the title Outrageous um, reflects how the anger was often punctuated with a sense of comedy. It's also a book about a lot of other books, books which triggered a, a kind of moral panic around what children in the 1980s should be taught around sexuality. And perhaps the most famous or, or notorious um, of these is a book called Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin, which was published by Danish author Suzanne Bosch in 1981. It was translated into English in 1983 and then released in the UK by Gay Men's Press with a run of 3,000 copies. Now, it's a book about Martin, his boyfriend Eric, and their five year old daughter Jenny. And the characters go to um, a laundrette, they have a birthday party and they encounter homophobia from a woman in the street. Now, part of the book, um, which attracted quite a lot of criticism, is, is that those couple of pages there that I put up there where Jenny was shown in bed with the two men. And in 1986, the Daily Mail reported that the book had been placed in school libraries by the Inner London Education Authority. And this was something of a version of the truth. It was in a parental advisory section, to my knowledge, but this started a panic with people actually burning copies of the book in the street to protest. Now, this wasn't a particularly easy time, I think, to be gay um, due to the discovery of the HIV virus, which caused AIDS in the early 80s. And the media were very quick to stigmatise um, gay men. Um, these headlines from various newspapers in the 80s um, show this. Um, Vickers feature quite prominently in some of these articles. Um, so the son there has, I'd shoot my son if he had AIDS, says Vicar. It's, a, it's an article which for me is a pitch perfect exercise in camp horror. You can actually see a staged photo of Reverend Robert Simpson holding a rifle to his 18 year old son, Chris. And um, the son is quoted in the article as saying, sometimes I think he would like to shoot me whether I had AIDS or not. And due to the fact that there were no further news stories about this rather extraordinary family, we should probably conclude that Reverend Robert Simpson did not end up shooting anybody, thankfully. Now, in the 1980s, the 
Labour-run Greater London Council had set up a, a gay rights working party and they'd funded a lesbian and gay centre. The GLC, led by Ken Livingstone, were one of the biggest thorns in the side of the Conservative government. And Livingstone displayed banners from County Hall on the south bank of the Thames, which showed unemployment figures or declared London to be a nuclear-free zone. The government got so fed up with this, they employed an act to devolve the GLC's power to London boroughs, effectively abolishing it in 1986. But this didn't stop opposition to the government, and a number of Labour-run local councils in London had started to give funding towards programmes aimed at helping LGBT people. Now, Harringay Council was one of these. They had a newly created lesbian and gay unit, and the unit launched a campaign called Positive Images which was set up to encourage schools to include LGBT content in their teaching. And one of the books that I recommended was Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin. Now, Femi Otatoju, who's pictured here, was one of the members of these, this unit. And she's described how they thought some of the pictures in the book were ridiculous. She says, you wouldn't expect to see bare-chested men in children's books. But they were just excited to see anything or something, anything that showed lesbians and gay men could raise children. And so they were willing, willing to forgive it just about anything else. So the campaign went ahead, they sent the resources guide to um, head teachers, and they offered to help them to implement it. Now, this didn't go down well with some Haring gay residents. There was a backlash, and there was a parents group formed to protest. There was a very dramatic council meeting in October 1996, with eggs being thrown from the public gallery, demonstrators clashed outside Harringay Civic Centre. I remember it all got on the news and crowbars and bayonets featured in the mayhem. Now the debate rambled on through 1987, which also happened to be an election year. And the Conservative Party used homophobia as part of their election campaign with posters which warned that Labour would wanted to make everyone's children gay. So the poster to the left there um, has someone holding a placard that says Gay Sports Day um, and answers on a postcard if you know what that is. And then in June, there was the election. The Conservatives won the election um, by 3.7 million votes, giving Margaret Thatcher her third win in a row. And later in October, at the Tory party conference in Blackpool, Mrs Thatcher was at maximum power mode making one of her most well-known speeches, where she warned that children who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values are being taught that they have the inalienable right to be gay. And for that, she received an 11-minute standing ovation. So on 2nd of December, 1987, a Conservative backbencher called David Wilshire put forward an amendment to the Local Government Act 1986 that was aimed to stop councils from doing what the, the act called um, promoting the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. Now that wording is a bit muddled. Homosexuality is a sexuality, it's not a relationship. So the main thrust of what the, the act says doesn't really make any sense. There was also quite a lot of confusion around what the phrase promote homosexuality actually meant. And they went round and round in circles trying to define this and didn't really succeed. Now that phrase promote homosexuality has actually been floating around for about two decades prior to this. Um, we find references to promoting homosexuality right back in 1967 during the debate in Parliament which actually decriminalised homosexuality. There was an MP called um, Sir Cyril Osborne who tried to water down this decriminalisation with a clause that would have stopped people from publishing names and addresses of gay people as that would have been a way of promoting homosexuality. The term kind of hung around for a bit. Um, it got used by high court judges. Um, it was quoted by Mary Whitehouse um, of the Nationwide Festival of Light. And in 1974, the Festival of Light um, rebranded itself as a group called CARE, which stands for Christian Action Research and Education. And then in 1985, the new director of CARE commissioned research, which resulted in a booklet called Gay Lessons how public funds are used to promote homosexuality among children and young people. And that booklet was sent to every MP and quite a lot of the Lords as well. And it helped to instigate the Section 28 campaign. And in Parliament, some of the politicians who debated Section 28 made no secret of their dislike for gay people. So the Earl of Halsbury said that homosexuals act as reservoirs of venereal disease 
and the lesbian camp is becoming increasingly aggressive. Lord Swinfin was slightly nicer and he claimed that schools were promoting sexual disability as homosexuals and lesbians were sexually disabled. My MP at the time, um, Elaine Kellett Bowman, during a discussion around an arson attack on the premises of Capital Gay magazine, said it was quite right that there should be intolerance of evil. Um, but my favorite homophobia quote is from Nicholas Ferber. He used to flamboyantly swan into Parliament dressed in tartan with a silver miniature working revolver attached to his belt. And he called homosexuality a morbid squint and talked about sodomy and buggery as being the result of deep-seated psychopathological perversion. Lovely. Now, initially in the Labour Party, there was muted support for Section 28, and only a very small number of MPs actually spoke out against it. One of these was Bernie Grant, the MP for Tottenham, and he said, if the new clause is accepted, it will be a signal to every fascist and everyone opposed to homosexuality that the government is really on their side. Now, gradually, other MPs started to get persuaded by um, Grant's perspective, and Labour and the Lib Dems began to mount an attack, although as the Conservatives had a solid majority in Parliament, the passage of the law was pretty much guaranteed, unfortunately. Now, along with Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin, one of the books that was cited in these debates is an example of shockingly explicit teaching about homosexuality was this one here, the playbook for kids about sex. And the title is rather provocative. It's actually a book about relationships and feelings, not just sex. And um, I don't know, I, I, I think it's always not a good idea to have the words kids and sex in, in, in the same sentence. Anyway, really, and then playbook, you know, has, has multiple meanings. So not really a, a good title for this book. During one of the debates on Section 28, Baroness Knight said that the book contained brightly coloured pictures of little stick men and showed all about homosexuality and how it was done. So just kind of have an image of that in your head. Um, and I will show you the actual picture that um, I think she was referring to. Here it is. It's that, that bit in the middle of the screen that I've put in a kind of red box. So you can see two gay men there and they're out buying pot plants at the garden centre, shamelessly flaunting it by holding hands. And then the next picture alongside that shows two women who are engaging in the shocking practice of flying a kite together while one has their arm around the other. So not really the catalogue of filth um, that Baroness Knight had built us up to expect. And you may ask why nobody bothered to get hold of that book at the time. It should have been fairly easy, considering it was supposedly freely available at all the libraries of the schools and the left-wing councils across the country, apparently. Now, as I said, the Conservatives had a big majority in Parliament and they were reflecting popular attitudes of the time, which in turn had been influenced by the media, by the newspapers. There was a British Social Attitudes survey um, taken in 1987 and it indicated that 64% of British people thought that homosexuality was always wrong. And in another 11% thought it was sometimes wrong. That's a lot of people. Um, and in 1988, Clause 28 became legal, turning into Section 28. But it didn't happen without a great deal of opposition. This photo is taken from a demonstration called Never Going Underground that occurred in Manchester on the 20th of February, 1988, attended by about 20,000 people. And at the demonstration, speeches were made by um, the actor Ian McKellen, that's the chap there in the white coat, if you don't recognize. Um, he'd come out the month before um, during a debate about Section 28 on Radio 3. To his left there is Michael Cashman. Um, some of you may be old enough um, to remember that he played the, the first the first gay character in EastEnders, Colin. And he gave a speech um, at the event too, and also did um, Stephen Parry who, on the far left. He's a, a young actor who played a, a gay character in, in the soap opera Brookside on Channel 4. And there were massive protests like this um, up and down the country in places like Brighton, Leeds, um, London, and Birmingham. And I think one unintended outcome of Section 28 was it brought people together. It gave them a common cause to fight against, and also it caused a great deal of LGBT plus people to become politicized, to come out of the closet, to campaign for gay rights, and also to meet one each other and, and to fall in love or to, to cop off. Um, the Labour MP, Chris Smith, told me that he met his partner of 24 years during one of these lobbying meetings that took place at Westminster. 
Now, there were also some hilarious acts of direct action, which took place during this period, some of my, my favorite bits of the story. So one of the first, most famous acts of protest occurred during a House of Lords debate that took place on the 2nd of February, 1988. A group of young women, some of whom had been involved in protests at Greenham Common, had been thinking about taking imaginative, non-violent direct action. And they discussed various ideas, um, one which involved using a boat to, to board Minster, Westminster that way, but they came up with a plan. And one of the women, Susanna Bauer, who's got her hand up there, second on the left, she told me that on the day her and a group of her friends arrived at Parliament, they tied lengths of clothesline around their waists and their jackets that they bought from Clapham Market. Security guards didn't seem to notice when one of those lengths of clothesline fell on the floor and they let the women into the building anyway. The women managed to persuade one of the more sympathetic lords, Lord um, Monkswell, to sign them into the peers guest gallery. And so the women sat there, they watched the debate take place on the floor below, and then when the lords voted to pass Clause 28, they got the clotheslines out and they tied them to the balcony railings. And then to the shock of the watching lords and ladies, the women went over the edge of the railings. And later on, the press called this abseiling, but it wasn't abseiling really, it was just shinning down these lengths of clothesline. Um, Susanna told me that she got kind of rope burns on her hands as she went down. And as they descended to the floor of the House of Lords, they shouted, lesbians are out. And it fell to the gentleman usher of the Black Rod, Sir John Jingle, to try to remove them and impose order. And there was a bit of a scuffle. One usher got kicked, um, several others got punched apparently. One usher apparently almost lost his trousers in the scuffle too. And during all this pandemonium, a couple of the women just simply walked out of the building and got away with it. Um, but several others, including some of the women who hadn't even been involved in it, they got kind of apprehended, rounded up um, and put into a cell um, next to Big Ben. But the arresting officer must have been on their side, I think, because they were given tea and coffee. Um, they were allowed to watch television before they were released without charge. And they were actually shown the cell where um, um, some of the suffragettes were, were held as well many years earlier. But the women were just getting started. And a few months later, on May the 23rd, which I remember very well because it was my 16th birthday and I was actually having my birthday cake when I was watching this, members from the same group decided to carry out another even more audacious invasion, this time of the BBC six o'clock news studio while the news was live on air. These women included um, Sally Francis and Buan Temple, who was a carpenter who built a refuge for Asian women and the Women's Centre um, at Harangay. Now, the bill was due to become a law the next day, so the women felt this was really their last chance to protest. And they were very concerned about the lack of coverage of Section 28 on the news. So they thought, well, we'll just be the news. So in advance, they'd meant they got hold of a map of the building. They managed to get entrance. They had a bit of trouble at the door, but they got past the, the security guards. They ran up six flights of stairs to the new studios. They found some toilets and they changed their t-shirts and it's the ones that had pink triangles on. And then just as the news started, they burst into the studio. Now the director was watching from a control booth and he sort of clocked what was happening. He started screaming. He says, um, oh, fucking hell, we've got nutters in the studio. Get him out, get security quickly. Meanwhile, one of the women has handcuffed herself to a news desk and another one attaches herself um, to a camera cable. Now, everybody in the studio was completely shocked. This has never happened before, but it was live television. There was no going back and they just have to do what the British are so good at doing in a crisis, pretend it's not happening and muddle through somehow. So amid muffled shouts of stop section 28, one of the news readers, um, Sue Lawley, somehow managed to read out the headlines. And you can see from that picture, there was a bit of an issue with the graphics appearing kind of over the top of her face there. Um, but this was the least of their worries, I think, at that point. As Sue read out the headlines, the other newsreader, Nicholas Witchell, was sitting on top of one of the women, placing a hand over her mouth. And you can actually hear these kind of muffled shouts and screams um, on the footage in the background. And the protesters said that she thought she was going to suffocate um, at that point. And meanwhile, Sue said to the 8 million viewers, I do apologize if you're hearing quite a lot of noise in the studio at the moment. I'm afraid that we have rather been invaded by some people who we hope to be removing very shortly. 
Now, the newspaper coverage the next day was not very uplifting. Uh, I've put uh, the headline from the front page of the mirror there, Bieber man sits on lesbian. The Daily Star was even less subtle. Loony lesbies attack TV soon. And it went on to call the women a gaggle of screeching lesbian harridans, dotty dykes and hirsute harpies. They like their alliteration in the star. But it referred to Sue Lawley as fair and feminine. Perhaps the best headline for me was the pink paper um, who simply wrote, dykes penetrate anti. So moving on, what were the effects of Section 28? Well, it, as already shown, it sent the BBC into a complete flap. A bit later on, the tabloids got hold of a story that the BBC was going to show a film um, called Two of Us. It's a love story about two gay teenagers. And the tabloids kicked up such a fuss that the BBC ended up showing it at half past 11 at night. I remember I stayed up late to watch it while my parents were asleep in bed um, upstairs. Um, I thought it was a great film, but they, the BBC changed it. They cut the ending, um, which was supposed to be a happy ending where the two gay guys got together. Instead, they implied that one of them had kind of gone back to his girlfriend. On the other hand, Channel 4 responded by trolling the government. Um, they created a series called Out on Tuesday, which aimed to promote homosexuality. The production company went by the name of Absail, a nod to the women who went over the balcony. But it was art and theatre, I think, which suffered um, the most. Um, in 1990, an artist called Sunil Gupta put on an exhibition in Salford called Ecstatic Antibodies, which was based around representations of AIDS. However, the exhibition got cancelled at the last minute and those involved were told, do not speak to the press. Another casualty of Section 28 was the theatre group Gay Sweatshop, which had its funding pulled, so it had to disband. But, it was in schools, I think, where the main damage was done, and actually I think still continues to be done. Section 28 created an atmosphere of fear and silence around homosexuality. Homophobic bullying became rife in the 1980s, with LGBT plus children talking about how they were spat on, shoved, called names, had drinks thrown on them, and generally had their lives made miserable. And, and I should know, I was one of those kids. Schools had confused or non-existent policies around homophobic bullying. Teen teachers felt that their hands were tied to confront it. And they really couldn't give advice to children who came to them um, to talk about being gay. Nothing actually in the wording of Section 28 related to classrooms, but it was an ambiguous law and nobody wanted to be the test case. There was an awful lot of self-censorship from teachers. And I think what was more important was that the message that Section 28 gave off, that homosexuality itself was wrong. We do not want our children to be gay, was the message. Now, despite the fact that there was a clause in Section 28 about preventing um, education about diseases, I think many children missed out on relevant sex education, um, information about safer sex and consent were often missing from the school curriculum and to the detriment of the children um, you know, when, when they left school later on. And gay and lesbian teachers also suffered. And they were afraid to come out in the classroom or the staff room in case it got them into trouble. And even now, many LGBT plus teachers who were around in the 80s and 90s still feel unable to come out in the workplace. Now in the 90s, um, as a result of the homophobic climate, climate, which Section 28 was part of, two organizations with quite different mission statements um, were formed. So we have Stonewall, which was a lobbying group, which had the actors Ian McKellen and Michael Cashman as key members. Now they advocated dialogue, talk to MPs and try to get slow incremental changes to the law, which will result in acceptance and equality for LGBT plus people. On the other hand, Outrage, whose most well-known member um, was the fabulous Peter Tatchell, was a much more shouty organization, which aimed at high profile, sometimes hilarious demonstrations that were eye-catching and provocative. Now, Outrage was an out organization of protest. Their members distributed leaflets about gay sex education outside schools, and they carried out mass kissings in public spaces. Now, it was at one of these kissings held in Piccadilly Circus that um, one of the actors from Gay Sweatshop, a chap called Richard Sandals, did something quite remarkable. Now, Richard Sandals had been arrested a couple of years earlier when he'd made a speech on the balcony of the House of Lords during one of the Clause 28 debates. And during the kissing, he climbed up onto the Statue of Eros and he would, I think he meant to hold a banner up, 
but he realized he couldn't hold it with two hands. So he dropped it and instead just decided to give Eros a great big kiss. The police who were watching said, bloody hell. And Eros swayed quite a bit, actually. It's such a powerful um, and beautiful image that I just had to put it on the cover of the book. Now, Stonewall and Outrage had very different ways of going about things. And at times, there was sometimes disagreement between them. Um, at least I think they made opportunities for protest a lot more inclusive because they offered such different strategies. And I think it also made it quite more difficult for the other side to counter opposition to Section 28 because the opposition came from, from different directions. Okay, let's move on to 1997. We've got Tony Blair's new Labour Party forming the next government. And there was reason to hope that Section 28 to today's was, were numbered at that point. But as the years passed, activists were getting increasingly frustrated that it was still around. Now, Blair apparently was quite cautious about how repealing Section 28 would look, what pensioners would think, and what the tabloids would say. So then there was an attempt in 1999, November, a Labour MP called Maria Fife tabled an early day motion that called for Section 28's repeal, finally, and this formed part of a local government bill. Now Labour had 418 seats, the Tories had 171 seats, so what possibly could go wrong? Well, the answer was the House of Lords. The Lords had already been much more traditional of the two houses, a much higher average age, and more members whose political views tended to kind of skew towards um, the right. And during the bill's second reading, Lord after Lord stood up to defend Section 28. The most staunch defector was Baroness Young, who warned that repealing Section 28 would open the floodgates to very unsuitable material appearing in schools for the use of children. And she said it would encourage many children to pursue a path that most responsible parents do not believe is right. So on February 7th, 2000, the Lords voted essentially to keep Section 28, and the government realised that they were heading for defeat. And they tried to compromise by suggesting an amendment to a different bill, although that got defeated too. And a memo written by Blair um, in April got leaked to the press um, a couple of months later. Um, and in it, Blair said, oh dear, Labour are seen as weak on gay issues. There's a perception that the government's out of touch with gut British instincts. So amid quite a bit of jeering from the opposition, they backed down. And it was actually Scotland who showed Westminster the way. Later that year, the newly created Scottish Parliament um, thought that actually there'd be no trouble whatsoever in repealing Section 28, or um, I think it was called um, Section 2A um, in Scotland. But there was an instant backlash. It was led by a group in Scotland called Keep the Clause, who ran a poster and leafleting campaign. And one of the most prominent members of Keep the Clause was um, a Scottish businessman called Brian Souter, who owned the Stagecoach Bus Company. And Souter reportedly used about a million pounds of his own money to fund a nationwide vote in Scotland to see if people actually wanted the law overturned. The results when they came in looked rather encouraging to keep the clause, 86.8% um, voted to retain it. We should remember, bear in mind though that only 31.8% of the votes actually got returned. Many people just burnt their ballots um, in the street or they sent the envelopes back um, with nothing in them to incur um, unwanted expenditure um, for the poll organizers. But in the end, after all of this first and all these campaigning, the, um, the law was overturned in Scottish Parliament on 21st of June 2000, with barely a whimper. Even the public gallery was described as being strangely quiet that day. So it wasn't until 2003, six years after Labour had got in, that Westminster was able to get rid of Section 28. So what had changed over those last three years since they'd last tried it? Well, first of all, Baroness Young died in 2002, age 75, and so Section 28 really lost its most fierce and scary advocate. And a number of other laws have been passed to that point. The age of consent had been equalized, 16 for gay men, um, and gay men and lesbians had been allowed to serve in the armed forces. And it hadn't caused rebellions by pensioners. The sky hadn't fallen in, the tabloids hadn't gone crazy. There was a feeling that the time was right, I think, to, to get rid of Section 28. And this time the bill to overturn it was a, a cross-party effect, um, effort, indicating that some conservatives were willing to support it as well. 
there was still some opposition in the Lords from people like um, Baroness Blatch. Um, but Baroness Richardson noted that actually with the internet, children can very now very easily access sexually explicit material. And what's more important is the need to teach them how to respond to that material. And so on the 18th of November, section 2003, section 28 became history. Now, funnily enough, you'd think that after all of the newspaper coverage that it received in the past, the change to the law would also receive a lot of press attention. But in fact, it didn't. I think The Guardian had an article about it on page six, um, but generally the national newspapers kept very quiet about that change. And so in the end, a largely symbolic law that had ended up causing a great deal of damage vanished without most people even noticing that it went. So what happened after Section 28 was repealed? What did the people who'd supported it say? Well, some of them died without apologizing People like Baroness Young, um, Nicholas Fairburn, Baroness Blatch, um, Elaine Kellett Bowman, and Margaret Thatcher. Others have apologizing, apologized for supporting it. So David Cameron um, made a speech apologizing for Section 28 um, at a Tory fundraising event, the Gay Pride in 2009, something which would have been unthinkable 10 years previously. Other politicians have sort of apologized for it. So um, Jill Knight, who was one of the original and people responsible for the legislation was interviewed in 2018. And she said, the intention was the well-being of children. And if I got that wrong, well, I'm sorry. I'd have welcomed a letter from someone who knew what the legislation was actually feeling like. And some people have criticized that apology saying, you know, it doesn't really fully acknowledge the hurt and the damage that occurred. Other apologies um, by people like Theresa May have been a lot more carefully worded. Um, Piers Morgan has apologized on Twitter and um, for his journalism about a gay kiss in EastEnders, um, where he refers to yuppie puffs. Um, and Michael Cashman, who's one half of that, that the gay kiss in EastEnders, tell me that he's forgiven Morgan, but he can't forget it because to forget allows such actions to be repeated when a different political environment deems it so. But generally, the political environment has changed. Um, Westminster now has an LGBT plus history tour of Parliament. I went on it in 2019 and they, they show you the balconies where the women sailed over um, to protest against Section 28. We can still see the echoes though of Section 28 in other contexts. There have been controversy in the last couple of years over um, LGBT plus inclusivity teaching in various schools in Birmingham, for example. A teacher called Andrew Moffat developed a programme called No Outsiders, which promoted tolerance and um, inclusivity at Parkfield Community School. And in 2019, parents withdrew about 600 children from, from the school for a day. And there were crowds of protesters outside um, shouting, get Mr Moffat out. And the protest spread to other schools in the area. Now, since then, Parkfield has held a consultation with parents, which has resulted in a somewhat altered version of No Outsiders um, called no outsiders for a faith community. And since then, the protests um, haven't returned. Last year, a new act called the Children and Social Work Act was passed. It made sex education um, compulsory in schools, although parents can withdraw their children except for the final year. It states that all pupils um, have to be taught LGBT content at a timely point. But also the teaching needs to take into account the relig religious background of people and that may call for a differentiated curriculum, whatever that is. So while there's reason to maybe cautiously welcome the new act, it remains to be seen, I think, whether all children across the UK will still receive an inclusive and positive message about LGBT plus people. And elsewhere in the world, the situation can be, can be pretty bleak or grim at times. Homosexuality continues to be legal in seven states in Oceania, nine in the Americas, 23 in Asia and Middle East, and 33 in Africa. And while the UK got rid of Section 28, more recently, some countries have created their kind of copycat versions of it. In 2013, Russia passed a law for the purpose of protecting children from information advocating for a denial of traditional family values. Like Section 28, it has quite a vague wording, with the result that it becomes difficult to hold a gay pride march or even wave a rainbow flag in case a child might see it. There have been mass arrests and violence 
inflicted on LGBT plus people in demonstrations and marches in Russia. 2017 saw reports of arrests, torture, and killings um, of gay men in the Republic of Chechnya. Opposition is growing in Poland as well, with most of the southeast of Poland declaring itself an LGBT free zone. And one newspaper actually gives out stickers that say that. And in November 2018, the president of Poland said he would support a homosexual propaganda ban. Hungary's parliament passed a law last year in June that banned gay people from appearing in school educational materials or any TV aimed at people under 18. So while we got rid of Section 28, its ideology is still out there. And Britain invented it, even though we got rid of it first, it hasn't gone away. But I want to end on a more positive note, focusing on what some of the people I interviewed for the book told me about their experiences. Now, for some of the activists, they went back and they went on to greater things. Some of them, though, went back onto their lives, including the women who invaded the House of Lords and the BBC News. And Susanna Bowyer told me that she's still in touch with many of the women and that within that group, people have different takes. Some are clear that for them, the action stands for itself and they don't want to take part in interviews. The fact that they did disappear was part of it and there's something very cool about that disappearing. Chris Smith noted a benefit of Section 28. He told me, because it was so egregious and so extreme, it helped in one really important way. It helped to change social attitudes. It actually meant that lots of decent, ordinary, non-LGBT people up and down the country thought these people don't deserve that kind of opprobrium. And Michael Cashman became a member of the European Parliament where he continued to campaign for LGBT plus rights. And he told me, between us, we lost the battle for Section 28, but we won the war for equality. And if you didn't stand up for what you believed in, you couldn't believe in yourself. It was that moment that led me to where I am now. And Ian McKellen said, the revolution happened without a single brick being thrown, without anyone being hurt. There were no riots in the streets. There were occasional disturbances, but we won the argument and politics is all about that. So there we go. Now for me, Section 28 is a story of heroism and humor in the face of adversity. The activists in the eighties and nineties fought back against an unfair law. And it's because of them that we have many of the rights and protections that we have now. Now, the UK is by no means a safe place for LGBT plus people, but it is a lot better than it was in 1988. And I can attest to that, having been around in 88. So it's a story I think that the LGBT plus community can be rightly proud of. And it's one that's definitely worth telling. And it's one that I was very proud to tell. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, doing these events where we haven't got an audience because you can't really um, gauge how people are, are, are reacting. But I would encourage you all, the way that we know that you're there, that you're out there, is to submit a question. So please do that on the question box, which I think is above us. Let me just double check. No, it's below us. There you go. You can double check as well. <laughs> Um, Paul, while we're waiting for some questions to come through, um, I have a question for you, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering what it was that inspired you to write the book, um, conscious that Polari was very much 50s, 60s-ish. Um, what, 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 what forced you or what took you to the 1980s in education? Well, I, I, I've always had, you know, a strong interest in gay social history, and, and you know, as, as you mentioned, I'd written this book earlier of the same publisher, um, Fabulosa on Polari, which had looked at fifties and sixties, um, and then, and then, you know, I, I was thinking it would be lovely to do something, you know, think about what came afterwards in the UK, um, and I was talking with my publisher about it, and, and sort of, he suggested, you know, would you like to do something on Section Twenty Eight? There hasn't really been a full book written on it. Mm. There've been books written on parts of the story, but not a kind of kind of overview. Um, and I thought back to you know, my 16th birthday, um, you know, how I was there watching, watching it happen live on, on, on the six o'clock news and, and how, how strange that was, I remember at the time. Mm. Um, and I thought about lots of things that happened in my life going through at various points in my life and how, you know, sort of Section 28 had intersected with my life at various points. Mm. Um, and to an extent made me the person I am in a way. I think I might have been maybe a different person if it hadn't happened. Um, so yeah, I thought, I thought it would be, a great opportunity, I think, to, to, to write that book, to, 
to trying to tell the story. I say I call it the story of the book, um, of Section 28, but it's really lots of stories. And obviously any book is only ever going to be a partial story because there are so many different people who are involved in, in you know, kind of getting Section 28 overturned or, or getting it started in the first place. Um, but it was it was a great privilege to be able to to, to speak to you know some some of those people to interview them and I think I think I kind of made them a bit a bit embarrassed because I kind of was so so grateful um, during some of the interviews and they were all incredibly modest um, and kind of mm. told them to shut up a bit. <laughs> um, I think one of the really powerful things about the book is actually the um, the personal tone of it. The fact that you do relate quite a lot of your own encounters or the 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 walls that stone that 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 the claws had put up um how did you how did you approach the research was it archival mostly or was, was it did it come from the interviews that you were doing with participants in in actions against it it was i, I just you know threw everything i had at it so mm. um it, i wrote it unfortunately during during the kind of the lockdown in in, in covid which which didn't make it harder to get hold of, of, of some of the material um Although in, in some ways it made it easier to, to talk to people because I did lots of interviews on Zoom and people were just getting used to that. So mm. you know, I was looking, you know, I, I think maybe people like Ian McKellen wouldn't have talked to me had it not been able to, to, do, it, to do it via the internet. So it, it wasn't as difficult to, to get to him. Um, yeah, ar archives were, were very useful as well. Um, and, um, you know, kind of look, looking through, through um, the media as well, look, I, I had access um, to um, a huge archive of um, gay and lesbian um, newspapers and magazines at my university, and I got them to subscribe to it called Pre the ProQuest um, archive. Mm -hmm. And then also I had archived to all of the, um, you know, the national press. Um, and then I got another archive, which was um, local newspapers too, which was incredibly useful because that told me about lots of local stories and um, things that happened in you know, places that weren't London. Um, and I thought, you know, I wanted to include as, as, as many perspectives and, as in, and voices mm. that I could in, in the story. Um, so that was very helpful. And then, and then the interviews on top of that as well. Yeah, great. It actually links in with one of the questions that's actually just come through from um, our friends in Norwich, who are, who are joining us today at the Millennium Library, um, which they've they've also be, they were interested in the archive and library resources that you use, but asked whether there were any hidden gems that you encountered that you um, you hadn't inspected. Does anything spring to mind? Oh, good question. I'm not I'm not I'm not sure from the archives themselves. Hmm. Um, one thing I did find incredibly useful um, was a, a, I think it was a Radio 4 um, kind of sort of documentary um, that, that had been put out um, about 10 years or so ago. And that was like a kind of, I think like that gave me a way in to, to a lot of the background that I didn't know about at the time. So a lot of what was happening in Harangay um, mm -hmm. and, and Femi Ototoji was interviewed on that show um, with some amazing insights. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also um, a, a vicar called, um, I think Reverend David Rushworth Smith, who actually went on a hunger strike over Section 28, which I, I had no idea that people were going on hunger strikes, not, not over Section 28, but he wanted Section 28 to happen. So he kind of went on this hunger strike to protest about what Harangay Council were doing at the time. Um, and, you know, kind of listening to it, the interviewer kind of didn't believe that he actually had gone on a hunger strike. And he kind of said that he went in a wheelchair to, to attend meetings, even though he didn't actually need to be in a wheelchair, but he felt that he should go in a wheelchair um, so things like that, I, I found quite shocking. I just hadn't realised that all of this was going on, mm. you know, when I was sort of 14, 15, 16 um, at the time um, in, in Harangay. So, so that was absolutely fascinating, that, you know, that, that those kind of um, back, that backgrounds um, to it, which kind of kicked it all off, really. Yeah, I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about the book was how um, you talk about these different different groups who were coming together and forming actions. I actually um, today ordered up one of the um, newspapers that you reference in the book, which I don't know if you can see that there. Sorry, Dykes Go on the March, which is a uh, outright Brilliant. it's a woman's woman's newspaper, and it's it's actually incredible all of the different places where um, you know Clause Twenty Eight was actually discussed and kind of campaigned about. Um, we've got a question that's come in from um, Simon who talks about you know his activism within and against section 28 and about the age of consent and the age of consent wasn't equal during this period as well. Um, he, he asked do you agree that we still have quite a long way to go in terms of um, making education around um, gender and sexuality um, well, improving it, I, I guess, is what is what Simon's asking. There's still there's still quite a way to go. What An enormous way to go. Yeah. When 
when I when I was kind of initially researching the book, and you know, I'm, you kind of look around at what's going on in your own life, and, and you know, I remember you know, my, my nephew um, kind of somebody said something homophobic to him when he was at school. I think he was about twelve at the time, and he kind of responded by saying, "Well, my uncles are gay, so what?" And it kind of shut them up. And I thought, oh, you know, that's really nice, but I feel in a way that's quite an unrepresentative little kind of mm. anecdote. Um, and when you look at kind of surveys, um, there's um, the, the charity Just Like Us, um, I think last year commissioned um, a, a study by Sybil, I think, um, an mm. organization that looked um, into bullying in schools. And, you know, the, the numbers are horrific. Um, you know, even though Section 28 has been gone for nearly 20 years, yeah. you know, the, the amount of homophobic bullying that's taking place in schools is still enormous. Um, mm. And it kind of shows that, you know, the, the message is, you know, more than ever, I think, need, need to get through. Um, you know, we've only scratched the surface. Section 28 didn't stop bullying overnight by any means. Mm. Um, and I, th I think there's so much work to be done, I think, um, you know, to, to, to change children's views at, at a young age um, and engage with them. I think there is, there is improvement in, in some quarters, but um, it's, not, it's nowhere near enough, I think. Sadly. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we've got another um, question here. Sorry, that's actually pretty much the same. Um, from Lydia. Lydia, did you find any changes have been made to teacher training since the repeal of Section 28? Oh, that's a really good question. It's not, yeah. it's not one that, that I was able to, to, to kind of include or look at, to be honest, mm. in, in the book. Um, so I, I'm just not sure mm. um, you know, if, if there has been yeah, there was quite an interesting survey by Pink News recently where they surveyed 3,000 teachers and 23% of them said that they felt very uncomfortable talking to students about sex and sexuality. Um, and that's just in general, not just not, yeah. not, not about LGBTQ plus um, sex education. Yeah, I had some, some figures, I think, in, in the last chapter of the book looking at sort of the situation of the teachers and you know, it's quite, again, quite depressing how, how few of them felt, you know, that, that they could come out, particularly the ones who had been around in the 80s and 90s um, as teachers. Um, you know, and even though it's, it has been repealed, like a lot of those older teachers, you know, are not out, um, you know, in, in a classroom or even in the school, they don't bring their partners to, you know, school events, things like that. Um, you know, there's, there's still kind of a, you know, a kind of legacy, I think, for that, for that generation, which is, which is really tragic. Yeah, um, I mean, I I'm, have a copy of Paul's book here right next to me. It's a gorgeous cover. It has that amazing photograph, which Paul showed in, in, in the presentation. Um, if, I, if I can, Paul, the last bit of the chapter that I've just read actually talks about, um, I think kind of what you talked about in, in your talk, where there's this storm, if you like, of early instances of HIV, um, becoming apparent within national media and you also have these arguments and debates around um, books targeted children and libraries and and you talk about I was terrified of growing up in a world where I would have to be where I'd have to try probably unsuccessfully to hide my sexuality I had no one to talk to I was scared of becoming HIV positive I was sure I was gay but was terrified of my parents finding out um, I mean that really resonated with me um, I think there's probably about a decade between us I was born in I was born in 1980 um, do you what 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 do you make of um, the fact that the repeal of section 28 just went so under the radar, do you think that was in, in any way tied in with a lot of the stuff that was going on in the early 80s around HIV and, and uh, this huge government backlash around education? I think, I think in a sense, I mean, a lot, a lot of the newspapers supported it. And I think, you know, they, they weren't that happy that it was repealed. And I think, but I think they also knew that they, you know, if they said, if they wrote that, that mm. it wouldn't go down well um, you know, they were on the wrong side of history there. So they just chose to ignore it, I think, um, you know, ro rather than, than, than reporting that, that the change was happening. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was a great moment. And, you know, in, in the book, you know, there was a, there was a great party and, you know, um, Stonewall held a big, a big event and, and lots of people came along to it and there was celebrated it going um, at midnight. But, you know, I, I, I do, I, know, I talk about, you know, the next day people just got up and went to school as usual. And mm. I, I get the impression that it wasn't this massive overnight change where you know, homophobia magically vanished from, from the shores of the UK. Um, you know, it, it was a very symbolic law in itself. In a sense, Section 28 was kind of 
the symptom of the homophobia. It wasn't the cause of the homophobia, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, mm. But, you know, it, it, the, the, even if Section 28 hadn't happened, there was still an incredibly homophobic atmosphere around in the 80s, um, which, you know, which was going to take a lot of reversing, I think, mm. um, to go away. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we've had, um, act I'll ask, I'll ask, uh, ask this uh, question. Uh, you, uh, you describe um, Section 28 and education as a bumpy, balmy British story. Um, what, what do you think is so British about it, apart from the fact that it was a British law, obviously? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of things. I think, um, you know, Susanna Bowyer, one of the women who went over the, you know, the, the railings, um, you know, because she told me it was like it was like something out of Carry On film, you know, which is incredibly British. And you know, I think, you know, Carry On Section Twenty Eight is a film that needs to be made. I think definitely. <laughs> um, it's a shame that Kenneth Williams isn't around because I can imagine him playing a, an outraged House of, um, member of the House of Lords, absolutely um, you know, pontificating and um, at the same With time. Being <laughs> um, so you know, you've, you've got. You've got that kind of like these kind of farce like scenes of the invasions, I think, which were, you know, hilarious and slightly bungled as well. If, you know, the, the ropes dropping off on the floor and then getting through anyway because the police were so incompetent, they couldn't spot it. Mm. Um, so you've got that. And then I think there's also something about the kind of the, the politeness of it all. Um, you know, the, the, the debate that Ian McKellen did when he came out on, on, on Radio 3, um, he debated the, um, I think the editor of the Sunday Telegraph. You know, it's, it's, they're both incredibly polite to each other, even though they, they're, they're really disagreeing with one another. They're so well mannered. And the, and the women who invaded the BBC, um, when they were being cut free from their handcuffs, one of them says, thank you very much, very politely. And I think, you know, I think only in Britain would somebody say that. And then afterwards, they, they talked about how shocked they were that Nicholas Witchell had sworn, and you know, you swear words at them. And they said, oh, mm. I couldn't believe his language. You know, not someone from the BBC. <laughs> and again, it's this kind of, I, know, I don't think British people are the politest people in the world, but mm. we're certainly, I think, the, the country where we're the most obsessed with politeness and we talk about mm. it the most mm. in the world, maybe. Um, so, you know, there's that kind of, that running through through kind of all of this, the chapters of Section 28, I think, mm. that kind of British sensibility, the kind of the, the madcap humour and, and the sort of the politeness of it all, I think, which I really like as, as a yeah. British yeah absolutely i think i'd agree with that um an element of camp even in protest um we've got a really good question here from justin hello justin um did you find evidence of teachers or students disregarding or subverting section 28 in their schools were these stories of resistance or agency in addition to those of danger and persecution there were odd bits and pieces I think people maybe didn't want to admit at the time but there, there were I think particularly in subjects like English literature I mm. think some some more progressive teachers were able to kind of smuggle um, kind of more positive messages um, you know it, by, by choosing certain books maybe or plays um, you know in, in, into the classroom um, and kind of getting through it that way there's an amazing woman um, called Sue Sanders um, who, who kept coming up again and again in the story in various points of the story um, she's a teacher um, and I remember, you know, her, her kind of attitude towards it was was my, was my one of my favourite ones. And it sort of, she talks about how somebody had written Sue Miss Sanders is a lesbian on the blackboard when she came into the classroom and she kind of saw it. And she kind of says, you know, so what? You know, it's not news. Everybody knows that. Why do you feel the need to, to kind of write it? And then she kind of told them all that, you know, if they finish their maths, then at the end of the lesson, um, you know, she would be, they could have a discussion about, about it all. Um, and, and they all finished very, very quickly that day since they, they had their discussion. One of the children did tell their parents and the parents complained about it and she wasn't allowed to teach that, that child again. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there were consequences to this. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, things, things like that do, do indicate that, that, you know, there were pockets of rebellion, I think. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't every single teacher felt that they couldn't say something. Some, some mm -hmm. certainly did try. <laughs> Yeah, um, we've had lots of messages come through saying thank you for the talk, very informative, congratulations, including from Jim and Uli, who are at Gaze the Word. Yeah. And just to remind you that you can purchase the book um, from our sponsors, Gaze the Word, through the links on the screen there. Um, Paul, before we, um, before we wrap up, we've got one more question, which I think might be an interesting way of, of, um, of wrapping up. Um, which is from Alan. Um, what do you think members of groups with other protected characteristics have to learn from the story of Section 28, if anything? That's a really good question. Yes. Um, I think, I think um, not, not to lose hope, not to lose sight of the, of the, of the end goal. 
not maybe to develop fractures amongst yourselves or with other people who maybe have the same goal as you but want to go about it in a different way um and i think that was something which when i talked to some of the activists now and they talked about at the time how they were they were kind of more disagreeable with each other and this is sometimes a bit disapproving of the ways that other people went about it mm. and now they say in hindsight they wish they hadn't that you know it actually it was a good thing that there were all these different ways um of, re of, of responding to section 28 and you know that just allows more people to get involved in it and okay maybe you don't disagree with them the means and the method but you know the kind of the end goal is love broadly the same you know equality mm. and, and, and saving children from from bullying and things like that and who doesn't want that so you know i think i think kind of maybe maybe a kind of acceptance of, of fractures um rather than trying to kind of fix them or kind of you know kind of say no my way of doing it's the right way um you know kind of maybe allowing there to be lots of different ways going on as well um i think is maybe one thing to learn from it and and, and also not to give up i think that's you know that's so important um, mm. And even even if it feels like it's a failure, because you know the, the protest didn't stop Section Twenty Eight from happening, mm. but the protest didn't you know the protest caused more people to get involved, and you know and, it, and it's, it's a long term thing. So I think often you have to kind of do be prepared to be in it for the long game, as mm. these people were, not and not to kind of think, well, okay, it hasn't happened, we're just going to give up. You know, you've got to be in it maybe for years. Mm. I think also not to just do it on social media. I think mm. all of this happened without social media, without without the internet. Um, you know, people use their fax machines, things like that, to get to, to get marches organised and their philo faxes. Um, and you know, and considering you know there wasn't all of that, you know, ease of the internet. You know, it was amazing how 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 much organisational work went mm. into things. And I think you know today it is very easy to kind of like something on Twitter and feel like you've done your bit, and you know, and it's not enough. I think often, I think you have to show up in person, campaign, you know, write letters, lobby, do more than just, you know, kind of a social media campaign, I think definitely. Mm. And I think that's something we can learn from those people because they did it old school mm. and they won. Yeah, I mean, and like you mentioned in your talk, the sort of the serendipity of meeting people, forming alliances, forming relationships, etc. We're going to wrap up, but I want to finish with just a, a quick message that's come through from Steve. Um, Steve says, um, not really a question, but as an out secondary school teacher who runs an LGBTQ plus society at school, where the students are really fascinated by Section 28, I wanted to say thank you for writing this book. As someone whose entire school life was during the Section 28 years, it is a fantastic, informative and powerful read. Um, and I'd really like to second that as well. Even halfway through, you, you know, it resonates so much um, with me as a person who was was you know in, in education during during this legislation. So, thank you very much for writing it, uh, Paul, and thank you for for joining us this evening. Um, thank you to every, all of you for, for joining us as well. Um, please keep an eye on our What's On pages um, on the British Library website for what's going on. Um, there are other events happening during LGBTQ plus History Month, which you might be interested in. And you can also watch past events on the British Library player. And um, you can find a link to that on our website as well. Thank you very much for joining us this evening and take care.